So we're talking about social media listening, and Brooke did a great job setting up the importance of social media listening. And I'm going to talk about social media listening overall in three distinct aspects, okay? But before I do, um, I started my agency four years ago, June 2018. And in the spring of 2017, I led all the social media um, efforts on 84 Lumber's Super Bowl commercial called The Journey. If you're not familiar with The Journey, it's one of the top 10 Super Bowl commercials in the history of the Super Bowl. Um, highly controversial, so much so that Saturday Night Live lampooned it the week after the Super Bowl. Um, social media listening was critically important to this campaign. What many people don't realize is Maggie Hardy, who's the CEO of 84 Lumber, the journey is about a um, Guatemalan woman and her young daughter who take the arduous journey from Guatemala through Central America and Mexico to emigrate to the United States. Um, at the time, President Trump had just been elected. He had talked about building a wall. And at the end of this journey, it shows them coming to the wall, going across the wall, and then seeing a big door and coming through that door. Um, across the country, it created a heated debate. And the CEO of 84 Lumber actually backtracked in regards to positioning. The whole point of the campaign was to position 84 Lumber as an employer that welcomed divergent opinions. They had 400 management positions that they could not fill. They were looking to recruit from MBA programs across the United States. That's what this commercial was meant to do, okay? However, at the same time, 84 Lumber is the largest supplier of whole home building materials to home builders across the United States, a relatively conservative group of, of business owners. So while repositioned the company, it also presented them in a challenging position with their primary constituency. And Ms. Hardy, in the heat of being interviewed within 24 hours after the Super Bowl, um, pretty much 180'd on the positioning of the, of the spot. Our social media war room um, with NetBase and at the time SpreadFast, which has since been acquired, if we didn't have that war room in social media listening, it would have been a complete disaster because we had to very delicately, as Brooke talked about in regards to listening and reacting, very delicately handle conversations from, for instance, the Latino rebels who are headquartered out of LA were very upset that the, the journey that was articulated wasn't accurate, especially in regards to how difficult it is to legally, legally emigrate to the United States. We had to manage those conversations. At the same time, we had to manage conversations from right-leaning organizations were upset with, the, with um, the spot that it welcomed illegal immigration. So no one organization was very happy with the message, particularly because if we would have been maintained consistency, but in the interviews after the Super Bowl, it created a lot of confusion, which is why I started my agency, Fifth Influence. So I have a 25 year career in advertising, primarily digital advertising. Um, I built Bruner's social media practice from a one person organization of 20 people, four to $5 million. After the Super Bowl, number one, you can work your entire career, never work on a Super Bowl campaign. So I'd done that. I was an empty nester. My children had, had, had left the home. One had graduated college, the other was in college. And I won a new challenge. Seeing the results of that Super Bowl campaign, particularly with immigration, I wanted to create an agency that primarily focused on issue advocacy. And what we do is we create emotive and performance-driven campaigns for progressive organizations, brands, issue advocacy groups, and political campaigns. So unlike many advertising agencies or marketing consultancies, we wear our politics on our sleeve. We work left of center. And I have friends that are across the aisle um, most prominently Jeff Cohen, who used to be chief of staff for Connie Mack Jr. It doesn't mean that I'm not friendly and we don't share, but we only work with progressive organizations, which is gonna influence part of my um, presentation today on social media listening. Now let's talk about analytics, all right? I teach digital and social media analytics at the University of Pittsburgh's CATS MBA program. It's an immersive course. We cover everything from journey mapping to owned analytics, paid analytics, earned analytics. So up on the screen, what we're seeing here is we have um, Google Analytics, all right? 
very, very important. And Tom mentioned earlier, earlier he had a, Tom, are you here? Did he walk out? So, you know, I, I don't mind, you know, uh, being a contrarian. I disagree with Tom. I think Google Linux are critically important. I believe he had a very compelling presentation, but it's a compliment to Google Analytics. It's not that you can throw Google Analytics out. However, when I teach Google, Google Analytics can be a semester long course, okay? There are so many different facets that you can look at, all right, within Google Analytics. Then in addition to website analytics, we have our owned social media analytics. And I am just using this as a proxy. This is the new meta interface for insights in regards to Facebook and Instagram. And we are looking at reach. But you can look at overall reach. You can look at reach for each individual piece of content. You can look at engagement for each individual piece of content. Again, tons of <laughs> analytics. Next, paid analytics. So your website analytics your own social media presence, but then you have paid social media campaigns probably across a whole host of different platforms, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, TikTok, Snapchat, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You have to stay up on all these analytics. And then lastly, you have your CRM platform, and that could be HubSpot, it could be Salesforce, it could be some other proprietary or other platform and you're studying all the relationships you have with prospective clients, current clients, both for acquisition and retention. It's a whole host of analytics, okay? And I'm gonna skip two slides ahead and then come back. Yeah. Data without use is overhead. Data without use is overhead. We are so overwhelmed by the number of data points that you can have across all the different platforms, your own platforms, your paid platforms, from earned media, your CRM. You have to identify top analytics. What are your top key performance indicators? There are way too many KPIs to have a dashboard. You have to look at what is actionable, okay? And that's where we go back to social media listening. And I'm gonna give you three quick case studies why social media listening is so important and should be a top KPI. In the, in the three things we're gonna talk about today, we're gonna to talk about a brand passion index, we're gonna talk about indexing of terms, hashtags, emotions and emojis, and we're gonna talk about demographic indexing, which I believe are the three most important key performance indicators to look at from social media listening. Now, the three case studies. Um, prior to starting my agency in 2018, we did, my social media practice at Bruner did all the social media listening for the Home Improvement Research Institute. HERI is the acronym. We did social media listening across 10 different categories of home renovation, kitchen remodel, bathroom remodel, et cetera. Every single year, we'd make a two hour presentation of all the data points and identify um, not just marketing measurements, and when I say marketing measurements, measurements of, of the industry overall, but also insight generation. From those, Benjamin Moore approached us and said, hey, we have a challenge. We think that you may be able to help. So at Benjamin Moore at the time in 2017, um, summer of 2017, they were looking at Wayfair, Pottery Barn, and Crate and Barrel as a potential uh, furniture retail partner. They could not decide. The C-level suite was actually in disagreement. So the CMO, the CEO, and the chief operating officer all were picking a different retailer to partner with, and their arguments were all relatively equal. So the chief marketing officer came to us and said, would you do social media listening for Pottery Barn, Wayfair, and Crate and Barrel, and is there anything you think you can identify that would help us make a decision one way or another. And we never promise results. We say, we'll listen to the conversations and there may be a nugget or an insight that we can execute on, okay? So we plugged Wayfair in, we plugged um, Crate and Barrel, we uh, Pottery Barn into NetBase. And um, Brooke mentioned earlier in regards to sentiment analysis, this is where we'll disagree. Sentiment analysis, sentiment analysis now, whether it's in NetBase, whether it's an Infinity Atlas, is highly, highly accurate. So she used the term, uh, 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 derogatory term for excrement, 
which I won't use because there's really strict guidelines here at the GMARCON in regards to vulgarity. I'll just use the bomb, okay? If you say this play was a bomb or this play is the bomb, NetBase does know the difference. The artificial intelligence is smart enough to look at the contextual, contextual relevance of how you're talking about something and understand if it's negative or positive, all right? So we looked at Crate and Barrel, we looked at Pottery Barn, we looked at Wayfair, and we were looking at the different indexing, okay? So we looked at indexing of terms, indexing of hashtags, the indexing of emotions, the indexing of demographic indexing. And one of the things we found, which we found really interesting was Wayfair, indexed 20 times more for conversations around expectant mothers and nurseries than Pottery Barn and Crate and Barrel. That is particularly interesting if you understand Pottery Barn has a whole separate chain focused on um, uh, infants and young, adult, uh, young adults, young children, okay? So we took this information, we, we, we ran it through several times. And what we, what we took to um, Benjamin Moore Payne is, we think there's an opportunity here, like if you are really gridlocked and you can't choose between the three and they're all equal to you, we believe there's an opportunity with Benjamin Moore to partner with them and identify Benjamin Moore as the paint for nurseries and young children's groups. And they said, it's really interesting. We showed them the data. That data point from social media listening broke the tie in the C-level suite and they went forward with developing a relationship with Wayfair, positioning Benjamin Moore Payne as the paint for nurse, in, in that relationship, positioning the paint for nurseries on young children's rooms, okay? One important aspect of how a small data point can drive a whole decision for an, op, for an operation. The next case study is for, um, it's not Commonwealth. I wrote it down, hold on one second. It is the Court of Common Pleas. So, um, in Western Pennsylvania, Allegheny County specifically, last spring in the Democratic primary, there were 10 seats open on the Court of Common Pleas. And this happens really only four times a century, okay? So we had a candidate that we worked with and he wanted to understand what the likelihood of coming into the campaign, what his likelihood of winning was. We went in, we used the brand passion index, which I'm gonna share with you. We looked at all there were like 27 candidates that ran for these 10, um, 10, again, I keep, I, I keep thinking, want to say Commonwealth, it's not Commonwealth, Court of Common Pleas. We looked at it three months in advance of the, of the uh, primary election day, two months in advance of primary election day, one month in advance of primary election day, and then each week, and then the day before primary election day, all right? Our forecast of who is going to win those 10 seats in the Democratic primary, not only do we choose those 10, not only do we predict the 10 that would win, we predicted the actual, when I say sequence, the hierarchy, meaning who was going to get the most votes, the second most votes, the third most votes, the fourth most votes, the fifth most votes, et cetera, with 100% accuracy from the brand passion index based on share of voice and based on the sentiment for, that, for those candidates. Our candidate was not in the top 10, the candidate that we worked with and did digital marketing for. He wasn't in the top 10 at the beginning. He was 27th. He finished the campaign 12th, okay? Without, I believe, without working with us and understanding where he sat in that, in that candidate set of 27, he wouldn't, have won from 27, he wouldn't have won from 27th to 12th. We would have liked him to win, but he certainly wouldn't have doubled up, okay? He was, he was, he was outspent but he had a great understanding of how people were talking about the other candidates and where his position was. And we'll talk about demographic indexing. So just a couple of case studies in regards to the importance of social media listening. All right, we already covered data without uses overhead. Brand passion index. So I have some ex exciting um, comparison and contrast to share with you, all right? I did all these queries. So I think the best way to present and, and to instruct is to show you exactly how we work at our agency day to day. So the data you're seeing is exactly what we would pull up and we would analyze. And I start asking questions, all right? And you're gonna see how that process works. Um, so the first thing though, before I get into that, this is something that we did for the Oscars. So 
the Saturday before the Oscars, we put all the um, uh, best picture contenders into NetBase. We only looked at the Los Angeles metropolitan area. The reason we only looked at Los Angeles, because you can filter by geography, is that's where the majority of the Academy lives. They live in Los Angeles. So we thought it would be a good representation of how the Academy may vote for best picture. In the top left, yes, your top left. The top left, let me, let me describe this chart, okay? To the left, the top left is 100% passion. So passion is measured zero to 100, okay? From the bottom to the top. And then sentiment is measured, net sentiment is measured 100 to negative 100 on the bottom axis, all right? So again, passion zero to 100 from the bottom to the top and then net sediment 100 to negative 100, okay? You can see all the best picture nominees here for the Academy Awards. The size of the bubble is the volume of conversation. It's the share of voice. So of all the mentions of all the movies, the larger your bubble, the more share of voice that you have. The smaller your bubble, the smaller share of voice. Then you're gonna see this curve. This is something that we took from Forrester. It's called the Forrester wave. Forrester does um, other types of analysis, and then they have a similar type of, of, of matrix. Anything in the top right is considered a contender or considered a, a platform of best practice so forth. So we stole this from Forrester, all right? But Nightmare Alley, a lot of passion behind Nightmare Alley, but in the wrong quadrant. It's actually a net negative sentiment. So we knew that was out. Dune has the largest volume of conversation in the LA area, okay, prior to the Academy Awards. But not as much passion and not as much positive sentiment as Drive My Car, West Side Story, Belfast Coda, and The Power of the Dog. When we published this, we published this the Saturday evening or Sunday morning before the Oscars. And in the analysis, we actually called out, we did not think the power of the dog was going to win the Academy Award. We thought it was between Coda and Belfast. And you may ask, but the power of the dog is all the way to the top right. And the top right is the, the, the best place you can be. It means 100% of the conversations are positive and they're highly passionate. But one of, the, one of the things that are challenging with social media listening is getting your queries and refining your queries. And query refinement can take weeks, if not months. We did this on a Saturday, we did this on a Friday afternoon and Saturday morning. So the power of the dog, it was pulling in conversations about just people's dogs. People love their dogs, right? Like the vast majority of conversations regarding a dog are positive. So we know we had a, a, a false positive in that query so even though Power of the Dog's in the top right, we discounted that query a little bit and said, we don't believe is actually there for the movie. We there believe we're heck, pulling in some noise. Coda actually won Best Picture. So as something in regards to marketing measurement or brand measurement, when you look at a brand passion index, it's volume of conversation, share of voice, but also the sentiment, positive, negative, net sentiment, and the passion behind that. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at we're going to look at the um, U.S. Senate race in Pennsylvania, the Democratic primary. We're going to look at the Republican primary. I'm going to show you a brand called Peloton and how their brand passion index has changed over the last four quarters, just to demonstrate um, this. Uh, oh, actually, ooh, I forgot about this. We're going to look at Johnny Johnny Depp and, and uh, Amber Heard. So you guys following this, this court case at all? Okay, which I think is great, right? This makes it entertaining. Nap time, who wants to talk about a Democratic race, Republican race? Let's talk about Johnny Depp and Amber Heard, all right? So this is social media listening over the last three, over the last month, all right? So Johnny Depp has a net sentiment of negative seven, but Amber Heard has a negative sentiment of around negative 70. There's more conversations happening in social media about Johnny Depp than Amber Heard, and there's more passion. So when people are talking about Johnny Depp, they're talking about him more passionately than they're talking about Amber Heard. But there's a great story. So we're going to look at the last three weeks. 
prior to the case, during the case, and then towards the conclusion of the case, all right? So this is just the summary of the last three months. And again, the, the way to read this is you want to be in the top right. Top right is the best place to be. I keep doing this because this is my... Top, top left is the worst place to be. Top right is the best place to be. I got to get reversed myself for you guys, all right? So we have no... There we go. All right. So this is the week of April 11th. This is before the court case starts, before it's televised, all right? Johnny Depp is at a 20, is at a positive 20 net sentiment. Positive 20 net sentiment. Amber Heard is about a negative 60 net sentiment. And the passion behind that negativity is at about a 90th percentile, while, people, while Johnny Depp, the positive is only around the 7th percentile. So going in, Amber Heard's already at a disc, at least from a social media chatter standpoint, people are talking about her negatively, okay, going into the case. And Johnny Depp's looking pretty good. That's the week of April 11th. Then we get into the case, okay? Again, watch this change. Week of April 11th, week of April 18th. The week of April 18th, Johnny Depp's net sentiment goes from a positive 20 to a negative 20. And even though he's humorous, on, uh, on, on the stand, which if you watch it, he is very humorous. However, some of his behavior that's being uncovered is troubling, okay? And so the sentiment around Johnny Depp drops 40 net points in regards to sentiment during this case. Amber Heard also drops in sentiment, okay? Less passion around her because the focus during this week, Johnny Depp's on the stand, Amber's sitting, you know, quietly, so the focus is on him, so there's a lot more passion in the conversation around him specifically. Then we get to the week of April 25th, okay? So what happens from April 18th to April 25th is he is very humorous on the stand. People start talking about how suave he is, how humorous he is. Even mainstream news outlets are talking about the entertainment value of the campaign. So he bumps up from negative 20 net sentiment to just a little bit above zero. All right. So the net sentiment re regarding him improves. Amber's still way negative, but the focus is on Johnny. There's less passion around Amber. So when we started this, a lot of passion around Amber Heard from a negative standpoint. But as the case moves through the month, okay, Amber's negatives are still a big negative net sentiment, but there's less passion. So if you're a publicist for Amber Heard, you're disappointed that there's not, you're not moving to a more positive net sentiment, but you're certainly happy the vitriol around her has dampened because they've exposed, even though Johnny Depp is a, is a likable, humorous guy, there is some behavior that is troubling. And so I'm just using the brand Passion Dex as if you're a publicist for either of these individuals, how you can use social media listening to coach your client or monitor what's going on. And I guarantee that their publicists are likely social media savvy and they have some type of listen, social media listening platform that they're looking at. The other thing about Amber Heard, when you, when you look at this conversation and it drops in passion intensity, one of the things during this case is she's mocking Johnny Depp every day. So whatever he wears to court, she wears, she mimics what he's wearing to court the next day. Okay. And People were talking about that, but that doesn't exude the same amount of passion as when she was claiming that Johnny Depp, that she was a victim of, of, of um, domestic abuse, okay? It's, it's, there's less passion behind that. All right, now let's look at the Democratic primary, okay? John Fetterman, um, Malcolm Kenyatta, and if I mispronounce that, I apologize, and Connor Lamb. And this is exactly how I would look at it. So I only did this query on Saturday, and if I was advising these campaigns, the thoughts that I have is exactly what I'm, I'm sharing with you, all right? So we're looking at the three can candidates in the Democratic primary, and, the, and I'll show the Republican primary, and election day is next Tuesday, May 10th. May 10th? It is next, it is next Tuesday? That's next Tuesday, I think. Yes, it is. All right, so this is for the last three-month summary, all right? Malcolm Cunyata is on the top right. People are very passionate about him. He has 100% passion intensity. He has about an 80% or slightly uh, less than 80% um, net sentiment, extremely positive. 
but he has a minority share of voice, okay? Then you have Connor Lamb and John Fetterman. Connor Lamb has the majority share of voice in social media mentions. Majority share of voice. There's more passion behind him at the moment behind, uh, compared to John Fetterman, and he's slightly more positive than John Fetterman. Now, the Madonna poll, Madonna comes out of um, one of the local Philadelphia universities. They are saying that Connor Lamb is a 30-point underdog to John Fetterman in this race, okay? I don't believe it. I don't believe it because I'm looking at the share of voice that Connor Lamb has and mentions across the entire state. And we are only looking at the state of Pennsylvania here. So he has more mentions over the last three months than John Fetterman and is positive, okay? He's slightly more positive. Now, if you're a political strategist, the one thing you're concerned about is Malcolm Kenyatta. Not because Malcolm can win, because he can't. What you're concerned about, though, is when we step down and we look at some of the um, terms indexing, the hashtag indexing, the demographic indexing, if you're Connor Lamb, Malcolm's going to steal share away from you where you need it compared to John Fetterman. And I'll, I'm foreshadowing a little bit when we get into the other indexing. But let's look at the last three months. Okay? This is February. John Fetterman is at a negative 20. And there's a lot, there's a lot of negative commentary about John Fetterman. If you're following the news at this time, it's revealed that he did a citizen, as mayor of Braddock, he actually did a citizen's arrest of a young African-American uh, male that he stated was armed at the time. And there's a lot, when I show the indexing, this is, these are the terms that are most associated with, jo with John Fetterman. So this was just breaking at this time. Connor Lamb is also in a negative net sentiment and then Malcolm is sitting, you know, uh, in, a, in a great position. In fact, Malcolm has sat in a pretty decent position the entire campaign. Then in March, Connor Lamb starts his broadcast advertising, okay? So prior to March, he wasn't doing any broadcast advertising. His broadcast advertising starts. You can see that he moves to a positive sentiment, and there's a lot of passion behind Connor Lamb. John Fetterman also move, moves to positive but less passion, Malcolm's passion drops a little bit, likely because he's not spending at the same level. And so the conversations about where is his fundraising, there, there's less passion behind his campaign. Then we're in April, very similar to what we're seeing over the three months. Connor Lamb's at a positive, about a positive 20. He has the share of voice in social media conversations, the majority share of voice. John Fetterman's also at a, at a positive, less passion. And then Malcolm Cunningham is where he sits. But I look at the brand passion index and you can look at crises. You can look at, and when we look at Peloton, I'll actually um, show this. You can actually map what's going on with a personality or a brand and how people are talking about them. It is much more accurate than survey research these days. Who picks up the phone? And, and I talk to pollsters all the time and they get very upset about this, okay? No one picks up the phone for a pollster anymore, but they speak candidly in social media. Social media is a much, much better barometer of sentiment regarding a brand, a personality, or to predict an electoral campaign, or an issue advocacy. So we work on the Family Care Act. We use social media listening. We identified with, um, so fa the Family Care Act paid family leave. So the Women and Girls Foundation that's headquartered in Pittsburgh put a consortium together in the state of Pennsylvania to get paid family leave passed. You are not going to get paid family leave passed in this state unless it passes the Industry and Labor Committee in the Senate and in the House. Okay? The Republican Party is the majority in both. They have the majority of seats on industry and labor. You have to have Republican senators and Republican state reps support this legislation. Through social media listening, we found that Republican women would not support paid family leave. It was about taking care of children. But if you talk about, they would say, we need leave to take care of our elderly parents, okay? If you focus on the elderly parents and needing paid family leave, to take care of your elderly parents, that sways, you know, again, this is, this is being stereotypical, but we look at aggregate populations. That sways Republican women. So we changed the name of the act from the Paid Family Leave Act Paid Family Leave in Pennsylvania Act to the Family Care Act. And in the districts of Republicans that sit on the Industry and Labor Committee in the Senate and the House,
we ran digital advertising in those districts about the Family Care Act and how um, you, you need it to take leave to take care of an elderly parent. They got tremendous amount of calls and emails regarding that act, which have passed both post the pass the House and the Senate, and the governor will put it into let will sign it into, into law this summer. All right, let's talk about the Republican primary. The Republican primary we have uh, Mehmet Oz, Dave McCormick, and Kathy Barnett. All right, Dave McCormick. Okay. The most recent article about this campaign said it is a three-way race, completely equal, okay? Dave McCormick is at a negative 25 and is tremendous passion behind those negative conversations. Mehmet Oz is, is at a positive 40 with a passion intensity of 40 and Kathy Barnett is in between 50 and 60, okay? Mehmet Oz has the majority of the share of voice in social media conversation compared to the two other candidates. When I look at the brand passion index, I would not say that this is a, a, uh, a draw between these three candidates at all. I believe Mehmet Oz is the front runner, that Dave McCormick doesn't have a chance, and that Kathy, Bar Kathy Barnett would, may actually, um, if Kathy Barnett does anything, she would help Dave McCormick in, in regards to his bid because he'll, she'll pull away certain votes from Ahmed Oz in certain areas of the state. All right, let's look at Peloton, okay? Last 12 months, Peloton has about a, you know, and again, this is just looking at general, we're not comparing Peloton to any other brand. So let's not worry about share of voice, but they have a positive like 12 or 13 in regards to net sentiment. Passion intensity about 60 to 65, okay? Q2 of, two, Q2 of 2021, though, they were at a negative 30. Can anyone tell me what was going on in the Q2 of 2021 regarding the brand? Brooke, you're shaking your head. I didn't mean to call you on the spot. You were just saying yes. I figured you... That was, that was sooner. Sex and, Sex and the City is a little bit sooner. Yes. Right. That was that was one. That, so there's a sequence. So there was a commercial that that they developed. Um, that he gets a which you're absolutely right. He buys a bike for his wife, and the the social media chat regarding that is how how condescending is that that a husband buys a piece of exercise machine for his wife to get fit. All right. So that was not that was number one. Secondly. Um, and, and the bigger thing in social media is they had um, children were dying underneath their um, treadmills. So they had, they had a, a massive recall of all their, all their treadmills, okay? So big negatives, all right? Now what they did is, you can see just in one quarter, they pulled the advertising. So at the same time, they pulled the advertising, they did the recall, all right? They, they sent out 125,000 kits for these treadmills and sent people to uh, retrofit the treadmills. So by looking at the social media listening, which again, uh, news media also picks up on this, but they put action plans in place to address the recall, to address the, 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 the marketing that was going on. And then since that time, it's come back down to a 20. Now, when we look at indexing, what you're gonna see is the majority of people that talk about Peloton and social media are not consumers. They over-index for bankers, for people in finance, for um, executives because they reference the brand. A lot about it is shareholder value. Also in Q4 2021, and I think there's a Q1, they bought Precore. And so they did an acquisition. Precore is, is the largest manufacturer of treadmills across the world. So given their trade, which is another banking type thing. So the other thing when it comes to social media listening is, Brooke talked a lot about social media listening in regards to both acquisition, but also customers, voice of the customer. The big thing about social media listening, when we look at indexing, it's not always your customers that are talking about you. It could be other industry pundits. It could be people that, other executives that admire you. 
it literally could be about your stock share price or the value you're bringing shareholders. You have to consider all those facets, which is a great way to get into the indexings of terms, hashtags, emojis, and then terms of demographics. All right, so let's compare John Fetterman and Connor Lamb, who are the two, um, they're the two top, top individuals in the Democratic primary this season, all right? There are two ways in NetBase and in most um, social media listening platforms that you can look at indexing. You can look at it by like bubbles like this, which I like for visual, but sometimes they don't pull up the names, or you can look at it by chart, all right? The reason I like the visual is it's very, very easy to see indexing. And does everyone here understand an index and, and what, what the normal score is and then over index, under index? So anyone, if you've ever done media funding and buying, there's a tool called Comscore. And Comscore does their index based on 100, all right? So if you're Nike, what you're looking for is you're looking, you're looking for media properties that over index for exercise, for instance, or sports. And you're not gonna buy advertising on things that under index for that. Same thing here. So the tool we use, NetBase, one is normal, okay? Anything above one is an over index, anything below one is an under index. And what we're looking here is, we are comparing all social media conversations about John Fetterman, a Democratic candidate for Senate, for, for US Senator in the state of Pennsylvania, compared to all conversations that mention Connor Lamb, and we're indexing them, we're comparing and contrasting them, okay? And these are just terms. So here you can see, for instance, Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman, obviously, they're re when they reference him, they're over-indexing, that's him, all right? Connor Lamb, he would under-index, all right? But when we took a look at the term of debate, for instance, People are referencing the term debate a little bit more, two times more when they reference John Fetterman than when they ref reference Connor Lamb. So there was a debate last week between the two of them, okay? This term debate is being used two times more in social media conversations when, when John Fetterman is mentioned than when Connor Lamb is mentioned. And then the red and the green, or the pinkish and the green, gives you a semblance in that circle of how much of that reference is positive and how much of that reference is negative. And we would dig into that. And so in this case, when looking at terms, if I'm consulting John Fetterman, we are highly over-indexing for terms like unarmed black man, chased down, allowed, which gets to this thing that was revealed in February that he did a sentence arrest as mayor of Braddock of this African-American gentleman. Can't really do anything about that in comparison to Connor Lamb, okay? But one of the things I wanna call out here in regards to terms is the hashtag, let's look at the hat, let's look at Democrat, hashtag P-A-S-E-N, okay? And the term vote, all right? John Fetterman compared to Connor Lamb. The hashtag P-A-S-E-N, which means Pennsylvania Senator, they're using that hashtag two times more. So when someone tweets or posts about Connor Lamb, they're using that hashtag two times more than the people that are posting or, or tweeting about John Fetterman. If I'm advising the campaign, a hashtag, as we know, is to aggregate conversation. I would advise the campaign to encourage people that are talking about us in a positive way to use that hashtag. Also, vote. They're using the term vote two times more when talking about Connor Lamb than when they're talking about John Fetterman. You may be looking at Tiffy three, uh, 330, okay, an actual handle, all right? This handle is someone that's, that's, that's quite outspoken and an advocate for Connor Lamb. It's actually a good thing that we, un we under-index because the only time that, that Tiffy 330 talks about John Fetterman is a negative way. So we want to minimize that as much as possible. Okay, next, hashtags. When you look at 50 times more, the hashtag blue dot, all right, which is, is a great positive hashtag for a Democratic candidate. People are using the hashtag blue dot 50 times more when they're referencing John Fetterman than when they're referencing Connor Lamb. They're, they're, they're using the hashtag live blue 
which is not completed on the right, 50 times more when they're referencing John Fetterman than when they're referencing Connor Lamb, which is also a positive, okay? Now, Pennsylvania, the state of Pennsylvania, the, the, the hashtag Pennsylvania, they are 100% more utilizing that term with Connor Lamb than they are with John Fetterman, which is also interesting. So these are just small things. Now, we always look for small nuggets. Some of these may be actionable, others may not be actionable. And I'm doing this analysis almost in real time, all right? So we already talked about hashtags. And again, this is the grid. So blue dot, you can see 50 plus over index. Um, live blue, 50 plus index, okay? Droz, Dr. Oz, this is great, okay? So if I'm advising the Fetterman campaign, people are using the hashtag Dr. Oz 50 times more when they're referencing John Fetterman than when they're referencing Connor Lamb. So they're already positioning John Fetterman as the Democratic nominee that will run against the Republican who they believe is gonna be Dr. Oz. That's a great thing to have. That's, that's like the assumptive close. People are assuming that Fetterman is going to be the candidate. So if you're in that campaign, that's a great sign. So a small thing that you, you can look at, and you may want to encourage people to continue to do that. Okay? Under indexing, again, PA Senate. Um, uh, we the people. Now, We the People Blue is a, is a movement within the Democratic Party. If I'm John Fetterman, we are under indexing so a little less than, than, a little more, a little less than half the time more. Am I explaining that correctly? I am. So Connor Lamb is getting that hashtag about 40 times more than John Fetterman, which means John Fetterman's not resonating within that, that smaller movement within the Democratic Party. And we would look at that, okay? But that is something you can pick up from hashtag indexing. Then emojis, all right? I love emoji indexing. When we did, I mentioned Benjamin Moore before, when we did Wayfair, the baby and baby-related emojis were the 50 times more over Pottery Barn and, and Crate and Barrel. In this case, John Fetterman over-indexes almost for all emojis compared to Connor Lamb, all right? Which we know populations that use emojis tend to be tend to be younger. They tend to use you know uh, varied platforms. But here's what's really interesting. All right, the emotions indexing. All right, which is really tied to the contextual elements of the posts and emojis. Posts that are deemed where people are excited or in love with their candidate or they love what they're talking about. Excitement. John Fetterman indexes 50 times more than Connor Lamb when it comes to excitement in social media conversations. He indexes two and a half times, or actually about uh, five times more when it comes to uh, posts about love compared to Connor Lamb. So if you're Fetterman, you got to feel good about that. Now, the only thing is there is much more conversation. Connor Lamb has the majority of, of, of share. So I don't believe it's 30 points. I think it's a much closer race. But Fetterman certainly has greater excitement and love in social media conversations than his opponent, Connor Lamb. All right, we've got six minutes and 50 seconds, so I'm going to go fast. All right, McCormick versus uh, Mehmet Oz. This is, gonna, this is very, very simple, all right? Anger. In social media conversations, people are angry about Dave McCormick 50 times more than, they, than when they reference anger with Mehmet Oz, all right? If you're Dave McCormick's camp, you have to be concerned about that. You have to be. And again, in social media, people do react to extremes, but that is an extreme index. If I'm McCormick's camp, I'm like, how would we possibly address this? All right, Peloton. All right, these are, you know, you would expect to over-index for bike and ride and classes and uses. There's really no information we, we would really leverage here, okay? Now, this hashtag, um, Tour de France 2021, all right? So this is comparing to just general social media population. Way over index, three quarters positive, one, one, uh, th two thirds positive, one third negative. We would look at this conversation and say, okay, 
what's the negative conversation regarding the Tour de France 2021 in Peloton? Because we're way over-indexing for it. So we want to understand what that's about. Halls of Ivy, that gray box up there, it's fascinating to me that there's no sentiment assigned to that. But Halls of Ivy is a um, fashion influencer, African-American fashion influencer, who, um, talks, who, who talks about Peloton every so often. And then Adidas, it's not finished here, but the hashtag Adidas, we over-index. So when people reference Peloton, they're also using the hashtag Adidas 50 times more than in other conversations, and it's 100% negative. What is going on between Adidas and Peloton in social, in social media conversations? And is there anything to act upon? Is there anything to take away? Well, we would certainly look at that. That is really interesting. Peloton is a sports brand, Adidas is a sports brand. They're relating the two together, and 100%, 100% of the conversation is negative. Why is that happening? Okay, this is what we find. This is what uh, our team found really interesting about Peloton. These are types of emojis, all right? So we over-index. When people reference Peloton, they're using flags, which is probably tied to the door, uh, Tour de France, right? They're probably posting flags to their favorite writers. Um, where, there, sports and hobbies, travel, okay? But faces, romance, okay, music, they don't use those types of, of emojis. We under-index for those, which I find really, really interesting, okay? We also, when it comes to emotions, we under, Peloton under-indexes for happiness and love. Luckily, we also under-index for sadness. But when you look at the emojis, this is really, really interesting, right? The whole thing about Peloton, if I was in their brand team and I was looking at this indexing, what I would say is we need to encourage our users to talk about how their exercise makes them feel. How, how the workouts on the bike make them feel because we are under indexing for those types of emotions and emojis, okay? We're over indexing for the bike and the flags. We're under indexing for emotion, which I'm really fascinated by because as a distance runner, as a father of distance runners, one of the greatest things that when you exercise is you're doing it for emotional health. So why are we under indexing for certain emotions and emojis that really should be celebrated in regards to our brand. Okay, demographic indexing. Demographic indexing, extremely, extremely powerful. And I will say up front, when I teach at the CATS MBA program, all the time they say, well, you know, is it statistically accurate? Whether you use NetBase, whether you use InfoGee Atlas, whether you use Meltwater, they will not present any statistic that does not have statistical relevance, meaning, there's a higher relevance, and when you see some of the percentages, if they know that 22% of the posts are coming from African Americans, and they can assign ethnicity to 44% of those posts, that's more accurate than any survey you're going to do, okay? Let's look at Fetterman, Connor Lamb, all right? Slightly, uh, John Fetterman, slightly over indexes for female compared to male, minor, all right? When it comes to age, it's relatively equal. There's not a lot of over-indexing, under-indexing between John Fetterman and Connor Lamb. However, John Fetterman under-indexes under for African-Americans, pretty significantly, actually. I believe, I believe he's at a 0.77 compared to Connor Lamb. If you're a Republican strategist, you may get all over this for the, for the general campaign because if, if John Fetterman wins, it means that the concentration of Africa, African Americans in our urban areas of Pittsburgh and, and, and Philadelphia may not vote for him in the general election. And if they don't vote for him and they don't go out for him, that means that there's gonna be less votes for a Democratic candidate compared to the Republican candidate. That is something that a Republican, a Republican uh, political campaign consultant is really look at, looking at, okay, when you're comparing. Also, in regards to under-indexing, over-indexing, if you're John Fetterman compared to Connor Lamb, you're under-indexing under with executive management. You're under-indexing with education. You're under-indexing for law and order. If you're a Democratic primary candidate and you're under-indexing in educational law and order, you really need to look, all right? Law and order makes up 3% of the social media posts for Connor Lamb and 
John Fetterman. It makes up 4% for education. My wife's a first grade school teacher. She's been a school, uh, first grade school teacher since 1993. My uncle was a sergeant in the Pittsburgh police force. You wanna talk about two professions that vote in every election and vote in big percentages? It's law and order and education. If you're Fetterman, you really need to look at that. Really, really need to look at that because that's a weakness in your campaign, all right? And this is completely better than any polling that you have out there, all right? Secondly, if I'm a Republican operative, I'm looking at this and saying, this is an opportunity for us in the fall, if Fetterman wins. We can aggressively go after, you know, I don't think they could go after education, but they certainly could go after law and order. Then, this is interests. So people that are interested in gaming, in sports, in religion, in arts and crafts, in music, over index for John Fetterman compared to Connor Lamb. With Connor Lamb, he indexes over Fetterman for those involved in politics, food and drink, travel, et cetera. Now, politics doesn't surprise me. Connor Lamb is the, is the establishment candidate. Fetterman is running as an outsider, even though he was lieutenant governor. If I was a Republican strategist, one thing that would concern me here is that Fetterman over-indexes so much for religion. So if I was looking at the fall campaign, I, I have to identify and say, that's something we really have to look at. Oh, time is up. Okay. Um, other uh, interests, automotive, fashion, health, and health, fitness, outdoors, those are those four to the right. Those are over it. So if I'm Fetterman's campaign, should be tapping into these people that have these interests, okay? Fashion, I can tell you right now, it's because of Giselle. I mean, if you guys know his wife at all, Giselle Fetterman? No? Look her up. She's like a fashion icon. She's all over all types of magazines and so forth. All right. Um, look at this. We're going to go through this. So I'm just gonna have, we're going to end on this. Boom, 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 boom. But I think you're getting the... Maybe. Back. Going too fast. All right. So I compared Johnny Depp to Met Oz. We'll just end on this. Johnny Depp and Met Oz just in Pennsylvania. All right. Indexing. Hispanics in Pennsylvania post on social media two times more about Johnny Depp than they do about Met Oz. Can't really act on that, but. If I, if I was, if I was uh, Ahmed Oz, you may want to grab Johnny Depp because people are talking about him two times more than your campaign among Hispanics in the state, which gets it some demographic target. So I hope you found this helpful. I'm over time. I don't, when we were going to break, if you want to come and ask me questions afterwards so that we don't take everybody's time, we can do, we can do that unless you guys want to ask questions and, and cut in the break. Okay.